Today on the Video Maker Podcast, Chris and I talk all about lens flares, light leaks, and film burns. Um, we actually get the site, the site is searched quite a bit for these topics, so I figure we should probably discuss them on the podcast in addition to all the articles we've written on them. Um, so we go into the details about basically how to make them and whether or not you should use them in uh, 2022 and beyond. Um, one note, actually, before we uh, start the show, uh, if you downloaded the last episode and noticed there was a gap in there, like a gap of silence, pretty long gap of silence, actually, um, that's been resolved. So you can go back into your podcast app, look for the, uh, I think it was called Five Ways to Improve Your Next Video Edit, um, and uh, it'll be fixed. You can download it again, and it will all be there. Thanks to our listener who called us on the phone to, uh, to tell us about that. Uh, I don't know if we would have discovered it otherwise. Um, so, uh, oh, as always, if you've been listening to the podcast and you enjoy it, we would love it if you went to your favorite podcast app and hit the subscribe button. And uh, every once out of every 99 episodes, you might get one with a major technical error, but we will fix it, I promise. But hit that subscribe button. It'll be extra convenient for you and helpful for us. So all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Video Maker Podcast. I'm Mike Wilhelm, and with me, as always, is Chris Monlux. Hello. Chris, do you know what episode number we're on now? Ooh, 99. 99. Yeah, we have, we have one more, uh, and uh, maybe we should plan some. We've talked about it, and yeah. uh, the last couple podcasts have been a little later planned, so maybe we ought to think about what it should be. Yeah, like maybe we should do it from the moon or something. Yeah, yeah. We'll just put green screens up, <laughs> yeah. and it'll look like we're from the moon. We'll put a little wind noise, yeah. although there's no wind on the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, Right before we press the record button, Chris was saying, hey, we should talk about the books that we use here for our coasters. Yeah. So um, something that we do here. I learned this trick. I don't remember where, uh, but from some radio guy that uh, one way to uh, cut down on the amount of like noises that happen in the background is to use a piece of um, a carpet swatch as a, a coaster for your beverage. So every time you put your cup down, it doesn't make a clacking sound, you know, yeah. it makes a soft sound. So. We've been using books as our coasters. Yeah. And uh, let's see. I always use the same book. I grab whatever, if I remember. That's, I think, more so. Most of the time, I don't. So everybody actually normally gets to hear Yeah, they can, can hear your, your can clamp. But I'm going to try to be better at it. And you, you you drink these giant, giant drinks with it, probably make a lot of noise as they come down. Sometimes. Yeah. It just depends on how much is in it. So the book that I always use is the second edition Lens Baby book. Oh, that's the best edition. <laughs> I believe it or not, we have this. I don't think I've ever opened this and looked inside. Uh, Lens Baby is a, a company that makes these like specialty lenses, mostly like for tilt shift, but, weird. Yeah, they're you know, just weird little stuff, pinhole weird, type weird lenses, lenses and stuff. Yeah, uh, always the same book. Actually, now that I'm glancing at it, it does look like there's some pretty interesting imagery here. And you see these images, and anyone who's watching this on YouTube can see it, but no one else can, I guess. They just have very, very interesting focus. You know, yeah, planes. you end up having like uh, like what looks like motion blur coming yeah. from an area, but it's actually like you know a blurry part of the lens. It's like it's just leaning into the imperfect is really, which I think is like a lot of people using like vintage lenses do that too. You know, it's like no, I, I understand this has a weird look, and that's what I'm going for, and doing it in camera instead of doing it mm -hmm. in post. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have lots of books around here that yep. publishers send us. Uh, what, what did you get? Mine's uh, Frame by Frame Stop Motion. And I actually picked this one because I was like, oh, that's an interesting topic. Huh. And that's what made me think. I'm like, oh, maybe we should share. What we, not that we're reading these books. Yeah. Uh, we're using them as coasters, but uh, still actually, you know what? I pulled them out because I was, I was searching for some good editorial ideas in, uh, you know, we, we, we tend to continue to boil that water until we have all of the the water boiled, I guess. Uh, but uh, so looking for ideas and I pulled out a whole bunch of books, but I think I pulled like two ideas out mm -hmm. of like six books. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We get lots of books because uh, book publishers are looking for book reviews all the time. And it yeah. turns out that it's pretty cheap to, well, maybe up until recently, but it's pretty cheap to make books. Uh, and we never, we don't review books, nope. um, but we get books all the time from publishers who want us to review them. Yeah. Uh, I th we actually even have one that's like a, a big old, like, was it Canon or Nikon's uh, anniversary? It was like oh, just yeah. a whole like table, uh, coffee table book of just pictures. Yeah. I'm like, that's my kind of book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had it on the coffee table here at the office for a while until someone discovered it. So it's just full of nudity. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fine art. Yeah, exactly. I guess. Uh, okay. So uh, at any rate, 
uh, we're talking about lens flares, light leaks, and film burns today. Yeah. So this is, a, I think, an interesting topic. I haven't thought about any of these things in a long time other than from the perspective of we see that people are searching for them, so maybe we should write an article or make a podcast now and then. Yeah. But it, I remember all three of these, Chris, were just like so trendy for a while. Yeah. And now... They're not as much. Yeah, they're, you know, they're still used. I just, I think everybody has access to something, one or the other, right? I mean, I remember the first time I used light leaks, we were creating them with our camera. It was, yeah. it was not like we could just go buy them. And I remember when I found some to buy, in fact, I still use those ones I bought. In fact, like on a lot of video makers videos, and I use it as like a transition flash yeah. or like, like just something to soften up a, a cut. Or if I have something that might be feel like a jump cut or something like that to soften it up or to add a little bit of energy to something, but it's not something where, uh, I think we, we once were using them in significant, uh, amount especially light leaks yeah yeah uh so actually maybe we should go through these different things uh you One know there's time. there's um you know all of these you can you can make on your own actually film burn might be a little difficult to make on your own um but um but we could go through these and talk about you know how do you make them and um or how do you acquire them and whether or not you should use them at all um and the first on here on our list is is lens flares lens flares yes yeah i remember lens flares began to gain popularity at least from my perspective in the 90s when photoshop came out with the lens flare filter mm -hmm. uh actually it was was it called a filter i don't remember what it was called at the time but you, you could generate you know phony lens flares yeah and then that made its way over to after effects and then there was uh, the big turning point for lens flares was um, Star Trek. Yeah, well, in in a practical sense of using them uh, intentionally, and that in that case, those were real lens, those were real lens flares. They use lights going into anamorphic lenses that gave the uh, the look uh, that they had there. But man, I I think I remember first using them same thing as a transition uh, and like going from one corner of the page to the other and it getting bigger to the cut and then shrinking away. Right. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, whatever it is. And those, you know, uh, I remember doing fake ones with uh, just a white solid and having it go up in bloom and, and come back down, yeah. having to make your own. And then, Oh, lens flares are now in incorporated in After Effects. So now I have this, I can move the center of the mm -hmm. lens flare and now I can actually see where it is. And I remember using those and not having a move, like using them similar to light leaks in the way of like to obstruct and make something pretty in a scene, but hiding the actual place where the sun, but having the glint mm -hmm. that's coming off of uh, the lens flare, um, you know, as part of the image. But those are... That's definitely not uh, that, like, especially uh, faux lens flares, uh, definitely not in today's, um, you know, looks. Definitely yeah. not used in a, it's definitely a quick way to, to date yourself is by putting a lens flare in your, in your scene. So just for the uninitiated, I guess we should describe, we could describe verbally what a lens flare is and what it looks like, I guess, right? Or you could just watch J.J. Abrams' uh, yeah. Star Trek and all that. I mean, the first thing you should do if you don't know what a lens flare is, just Google lens flare. You'll see, you know, in the image search of this. But basically, it's it's this artifact, um, like a, a visual artifact that occurs when bright light hits a camera's lens in just the right way where it, it um, Refracts. scatters yeah. uh, inside the lens and creates these sort of rings of light. And the rings of light are like every lens element in the lens. Right. So you could control how much is in there, just like how bokeh or bokeh, however you want to, uh, is affected by the lens's iris shape. Uh, this mm -hmm. is the the amount of lenses, and that's why they put a lot of coatings on some lenses mm -hmm. to reduce the real lens flares, why you'd use a hood or, um, you know, a matte box or anything like that. Those are to get, to keep those away when you don't want them. Now, they're they're nice when you kind of can lean into them and they're real. Uh, real, real lens flares, I think, are still in today's in vogue because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's it's very much in the lifestyle. Uh, you surely are going to find them in a lot of, you know, there. if someone's just shooting, you, sometimes you just find this nice light coming in the right direction and you're pointing in the right direction. You're like, oh, that's kind of nice. And you use it, but you're not using it in the normal. I think that's more like a, uh, a light leak almost uh, in how some of those might get used. But uh, lens flares are... Well, I remember the the first one getting really excited was uh, that Video Copilot made a lens yeah, flare that I was, was just going to look up. I forget what that was called. It was a more dynamic lens flare than what was coming just as you could change like 
the color of the of refractions and uh i think you could even like change from like uh like if you use different filters on your lens you'll get light to refract in different ways like a uv filter can make uh, a single light point look like a star you know it'll light will come off each thing or it can be round or whatnot and so you could actually go and change those and kind of see the different filters and how it look on top of it and you can make stuff look a lot more uh realistic and that's i mean creative cow that stuff at the beginning was really you know home cgi this is special effects for um you know uh, people at home and in it played a big role in that, uh, but uh, it was that. What else came with that? Uh, so the, the the plugin was called Optical Flares. Yes, and you know it came out at about the time that uh, just after Star Trek came out because um, Andrew Kramer uh, was colleagues with J.J. Um, Abrams. They'd worked on um, a TV show together, I want to say. But he made this this uh, plug-in, which has basically kind of helped people recreate these very unique-looking lens flares from Star Trek because they were anamorphic lens flares. Yeah. They and had this weird look where they would, like, streak a claw across the, the frame, you know, horizontally. Yeah, you can, and, and, you know, anamorphic lenses until recently have not been available at the uh, consumer or even, I'd say, you know, off-movie sets at all, right? You're talking about lenses that are... Thirty, fifty thousand dollars a piece, you know, for a fixed focal length, a uh, focal length, um, and but now we have we have uh, we have the anamorphic lenses in a lot of cameras. In fact, like every single Panasonic camera, you can shoot uh, certain different types of anamorphic, and because it is uh, sh collapsing the width and then you're re-expanding it, and you're doing that optically as far as how it takes your image and, and puts it to a square. You're, you get these weird artifacts that are different than your photo lenses and how they refract light. Yeah, so, um, you know, this when this plugin came out, people bought it and they started putting lens flares and everything, but they were originally created uh, when, you know, and popularized by J.J. Abrams in this movie. Um, and they were creating them organically right um optically Pract yeah they're practically they were yeah. doing it with really really high lumen hand powered lights and they were just getting close enough to the side of the lens and shining the light in the lens yeah i feel like i watched the behind the scenes and they were like you just using high powered flashlights yeah yeah they were they're like the the kind you could get with the cat battery on them that yeah. is totally yeah but they're just like yeah a million lumen yeah. they weren't even high quality lights they were just super high powered lights so right. they could and focused yeah. really hard light yeah so you can you can get this look yourself by doing the same trick just shine a, a really bright focused light into the um into the lens and actually it works best when it's kind of like coming at the lens from an angle, it kind of hits the edge of it. Yeah, exactly. You want to be like 45 degrees or more, definitely out of the field of view, yeah. uh, shooting in sideways, and that's, that sounds to work the better. But you're not going to get those streaks across the screen because right. you're not shooting anamorphic. That's what the cool thing is. Like we have a an Irix, um, no, is it Irix? Yeah, I think it's Irix. Uh, but it's only a 1.33 anamorphic, so it kind of does it kind of squeezy, but surely the ones they're doing are like, it's very, 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 uh, over the top. And, yeah. and I was actually just recent, I'm trying to think where I was reading it, but it was talking about, uh, the, the lens flare and how, uh, JJ Abrams felt, yeah, we kind of overdid it with that. But <laughs> I, I felt like that was kind of unfair to, to make him feel that way. Cause it's like, well, you kind of made the style. Yeah. Whenever someone goes, Hey, this is this new thing it tends to just take over and you know, no one would have known it was cool if he hadn't done it so intensely, I guess it yeah, wouldn't have like, been a thing to take over. It's like the guy that, or the person that invented the Macarena. Right? Yeah. If it was just the one thing and just went along and no big deal, but because it, uh, because they know, made a dance. Yeah. It's worth it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, everyone just ran it into the ground. Yes. Right? So that raises the question today in 2022, should you put lens flares in your project? I would say artificially. No. In, mm -hmm. Unless you are trying to uh, make it look like it was shot, like it, you're trying to make it look real. Don't yeah. use it, using it anywhere else other than like as an effect to try to make your shot look like it has a real lens flare in it. Uh, and even then it's going to be tricky because camera movement and faux uh, lens flares just don't look right. And you're just like, there's no you could track stuff and make it go there, yeah. but it's, it's just never going to work the way it does in your, cause, cause light refracts in just so many different ways that you, you, you can make it real close, but I remember struggling real hard to try to make it work, uh, especially on like moving camera shot. 
Yes, I, I agree. I think you should, if you're going to do it, do it in extreme moderation. Um, and if you're going to, uh, you know, try to do this, if you could do it organically, optically, yeah, then do that. Yeah, well, I always think of of uh, drop shadows and beveled edges on on graphics, and they used to be you if you you wanted them to be seen, they're part of like this thing. And now it's like, no, no, I want to use them just enough that they're giving effect, but not enough that you're noticing yeah. that I'm using it. Yeah. So it's so it's very very subtle. And so I think in in moderation, you could probably fit them in a lot of things as long as they're not trying to actually draw the eye. Right. As soon as they are, you should have probably chose a different subject. So there, this is the other version of this, Chris, which is the artificial lens flare that happens as a part of motion graphics. Yes. So, you know, you see this where it's like someone has their logo twinkle or something, yeah, or yeah. there's a light beam that kind of streaks across the, uh, you know, the thing. Uh, yeah, I remember, I remember doing it or doing it uh, very similar to using it like a bouncing ball on a jingle yeah. or some stupid. I mean, but none of them are good. I mean, yeah. there's lots of creative ways to use it, surely. But I think this this at this point, uh, have a need and then just make sure that all of the other ways you could address that need aren't better. Uh, and then you could use it. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a go to anymore, uh, or probably should have never been, but, uh, in motion graphics, it's a, it's a helpful tool to get out of, you know, uh, a screen full of graphics or something. Um, but it's it's very much the I always felt that was somewhat of a magic trick of you, if you make a big bright light in the corner of the screen you can move something else and no one would notice that move but they because they'd be distracted by the light so it's kind of the a little bit of the magician trickery we get to do as as filmmakers. I mean, uh, fortunately we're in, fortunately we're just in a spot now where they're just not trendy and be, you know just for the the simple fact that they're not trendy. People are unlikely to go overboard with them. Yeah. Although maybe maybe they will go out of they'll be out of style for so long that someone will come and do something really interesting again. Hey, you know what the 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 like sideways wipe or even just the wipe in, in general was not used for a long time, and then we got the new Star Wars came, and oh, all of a sudden they start being used in places, and now it's if you're you if you don't use it over the top and every transitions that way, hey, it actually works, and it's not this cheesy thing oh, that's just built in, but. I mean, I, I don't really love the sideways wipe, and it's really hard to pull off if you don't design the transition around that wipe. The crazy thing about those wipes is I feel like they have been just um, co-opted by the Star Wars universe. Right? Oh, yeah, like, yeah. It's a signature right. to, the, to changing locations. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and anyone who uses those seems like they're paying homage to Star Wars in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it just... just it, well, it, like fashion, you know, what what old is new and what's new is yeah. old, uh, you know, things come in and out of, tri in, in, of trends in that way. And, uh, you know, maybe when we're retiring, they'll be using lens flares and be like, look at this newest thing. And we'll yeah. be like, that was so last week, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, moving on to, yes. to light leaks. Light leaks. So this is the idea of pretty much taking a lens off the camera and having light leak into the space between the lens and the and the uh, the sensor so it feels yeah. like a little bit of light but it's a bloom you know it's it's starting and then getting brighter and there's not a whole lot of uh um usually they move in erratic ways uh but they feel very um uh natural i guess not natural but they uh more organic in a, in a scene than like say the pinpoint of a, of a lens flare yeah there's really no sharp lines in a in a light leak and actually maybe that's part of of you know what separates them from a a um a standard lens flare actually it with a light leak and by the way to see the difference is really it's really hard to describe you should google this but um a light leak happens when light hits the sensor of a camera without actually passing through the lens yes and um, so you're using kind of the side of the lens as the iris in this way you know like the yeah. gap the opening opening yeah so um this is uh this is possible to to make easily on your own. Yes. You know, if you're in a dark room or just a place with a blank backdrop, black backdrop, point the camera at it, take the, um, the, uh, camera lens off and shine a light at the, at the camera, just sort of pass the, the lens forward and back in front of the, the sensor. And you'll get these weird, weird patterns. There's, yeah. There's two things about it. One, you got to make sure your camera is set to being able to record with the lens off. 
Yeah. Uh, a lot of cameras, like uh, say the Canon mirrorless, a lot of them have uh, shutters that go in front of the lens when you take a lens off. So it's like a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. Whereas other cameras, you know, you get right to the sensor, but they still might not record. Um, and then the other thing is, is they work really well. They're, you know, they might be a little colorized depending on what light's coming in and how the camera's accepting it, right? What the white balance is and how it's perceiving the light. But then when you bring them in as something, you need to use them on a blend mode. And uh, I find Lighten is the best one, the best blend mode for um, using a light leak over something. Um, overlay tends to uh, saturate and, and really bloom really hard, whereas Lighten screen. can be soft. Screen, it's, some of them work, but I always find Lighten is the one that, mm. um, that works best for me. And then there's also ones that are like already alpha channeled that you just put over the top of it and then you're just controlling the opacity. So I have no idea, I don't know about you, but I have no idea the origin of these as a really trendy thing, but you see them a lot in these, in dream sequences, right? Mm -hmm. Like, or wedding videos, you know, because they're very bright. Um, you know, I, I think they came around when mirrorless started being used in digital cinema. I think they came out of the... Well, was it before that? I know that, that people were using these during the DSLR age. Yeah, well, that's, uh, well, then you'd have to, that would be like having to have the, the mirror up, I yeah. guess. Yeah, because you, you that. got to be in recording mode. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I guess I remember doing that, but it definitely, this is not a film technique, right? You're not doing a light leak on film uh, like this, I guess. You probably you could. You could, but it would, it, it seems like a, um, ex well, I guess if, if, if everything was equal, then it wouldn't be expensive, but yeah, uh, it, it's, it's definitely a, a, something that would be difficult to do on, on film and, and is relatively easy to do on your own. Plus there's like light leak packs. And uh, I mean, I have, I have one light leak that I use. I bet you I've used it 500 more times. I mean, just so many different times. And you you know, uh, you can reverse them. Uh, you can change their, uh, how long they're going. If they have some color, you can colorize them. I found a lot of different ways to use and sometimes they're not covering up a transition they're to add a little energy to something but it's subtle so it feels you know more like a, a reflection of a passing car just mm -hmm. went by you know that, that kind of thing where it's just kind of add a little bit to the energy of whatever you're doing i find like something's not moving fast enough but it needs to have some energy you might use one uh but definitely sparingly i, I definitely remember using them well on my music video uh we wanted to grunge it all up and so i'm like uh, cool. I, I put light leaks over the whole thing and, and I put them in there randomly and they just happen to feel like they're going with the music, but there was no intention of that. So it was kind of cool, but I was using it really mostly to make our really sharp, beautiful footage look a little bit more uh, grungy. You know, since there's not like a singular pop culture instance of this being like used, used like crazy, at least one that's not Apparent you know, at the moment. Yeah, no, nothing like um, Star Trek was for yeah. lens flares. I feel like you probably could could get away with this today, and I'm sure a lot of people are in wedding videos all the time. Oh, yeah. um, people aren't going to look at it and go, hey, that, looked, that looks aged uh, or, you know, dated. Yeah, it doesn't currently, at least, and I'm still seeing them in commercials and on TV. That's, and in move, you know, you're seeing it still in like dream sequences, which, you know, a lot of it can be very similar to like having, if you had a, some prisms in a room or something like that, and the light was, was going through them and hitting your lens very close to, a, you know, lens flare, but on a photo lens. So it's not affecting everything and it's definitely not defined. So I'm just uh, looking at light leaks on um, Wikipedia. And we were just talking about film, uh, and actually film is the origin for these, uh, and, and in particular, even um, still photography. So I'm sure, I don't know if you remember this, Chris. This Double exposures. A long ways back. You ever, um, as, a, as a kid, you know, you would, um, you'd get, have family photos taken on film, and you'd take it down to, you know, the drugstore or whatever to get it developed. And you'd get it back, and every once in a while there'd be a shot that was just like, there's like this weird streak of light on the right-hand side of the the frame, right? It's just like a, a bright orangish blob of light. Yeah. Um, well, that's kind of like an example of, of a light leak. And apparently it's common with 35 millimeter cameras that there was like um, some foam around the door of the lens, the lens uh, compartment, mm -hmm. that that foam just degraded over time. Oh. And so uh, light would leak in literally through this foam and exposed onto the film yeah i've definitely done it on du dual exposures right so you 
you take an image of somebody and then instead of advancing the film, you then put it, you do some kind of lighting thing to be able to put over the top of it. And by doing that, you can kind of obscure the, uh, the other image or the, the one image seems ghosted and the other one yeah. seems on top of it. And so you have it that way. In motion pictures, I, I just think it would be hard to control Right. Yeah. You know, like that's the thing is like every light leak I've ever done. Uh, there's none of them. I was like, I'm, that's the one I want to use all the time. And I guess I, I if I would have just kept using them, I would have found better use. You I mean, to use them. But they're every time you make one, it's going to be a little different. In motion pictures with film, you could kind of do it the same way if you got it on a black background and you digitize it afterwards, you know, yeah. doing the same thing of removing the lens partly or creating some sort of artificial gap somehow in the camera. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, we don't do film. Do that? Yeah, we're a video maker. Who cares? So verdict here on whether or not you should actually use these in a project today. I think it's green light. I, I still use them. So if it's not, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, an offender as well. Yeah. Uh, well, like everything you want to use them in moderation, I guess. But yeah. It's I, really easy. Just like, um, beginners use transitions to once you get a library of light leaks to just start using them all over the place, but get that out of your system. Yeah. Um, okay, so last one, which I think is the most difficult, which is film burn. And interestingly, if you Google film burns, you get a lot of light leak stuff, which they're not really the same. Yeah, the film burn is the, like, I, I, I think I remember the first time of finding out how they actually work uh, was, I think, the Green Day video Boulevard of Broken Dreams, and they shot it in film, and then they went and burned with cigarettes and and scratched up the the actual film so they could make get all these artifacts but that were random they they didn't you know they didn't want to have control over where they went and you know it was just uh heat to the film and i i would imagine this happens for when you know the projector reel's not pulling up enough and the light going through it actually burns the film mm -hmm. right and you said that there that uh, might not be able to make it on your own I think every burn I have used in the past was a plug-in. Yeah, digital. Uh, yeah, digital, because I've actually found it pretty hard to use like uh, alpha channel ones because the they might not work the way you're trying to do whatever you're trying to do. And I'm all, the burns that I always end up being is like almost more like the bonanza map, where it's a fire in the yeah, middle burning yeah, out yeah. or whatever. But but it's still that blistering of film pulling out away. I think of. Uh, Inglorious Bastards, I think, has a time where the, the film starts catching on mm -hmm. fire and it, mm -hmm. you see it on the screen. But that was back when, like, you know, the film was actually flammable. So it yeah. would have been an issue. Uh, but yeah, I, w I think it was, it's just, you know, uh, there, how do you project film? You got to throw light through it. So yeah. uh, it overheated and it looks neat. It's kind of that blistering, melting point of film, I guess. You know, I think uh, with film burn and light leaks, Kind of the only way to make good film burn and like light, light leak assets is to do it um, organically. Yeah. Like people who make where you when you get these plugins for film film burns, they're oftentimes just recordings of um, film with kind of just defects in it, right? Yeah, totally. It's just on a black background um, or a white backdrop. Um, I always see that they're they're usually combined with uh, seeing the edges of the film. So you're seeing, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah there's yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. of that. So it's like it's like you said, like the shroud and everything else burnt away. So you're seeing more than just the normal yeah, viewable yeah, yeah. area. That and you see scratches projected. and hairs and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And that was the the uh, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. I remember just thinking about. It. I was like, that's kind of neat. And they don't have the control. And that was the goal. It was like, no, we want this just to be scratched up. And here, I'm going to burn a hole with a cigarette in this frame. And you can watch the thing and be like, oh, that's where they, they burned that. And mm -hmm. then it kept going. You know, that's interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, would kind of like how they did the color with Oh Brother, We're Out That. Like they actually took the film and chose that whole colorized by processing the film that way. It wasn't a look. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which now today we'd put a, a look or a LUT or whatever you want to call it uh, to stylize the color because we can do that and have all the changes we can do in, that, in the end. But I think those creative challenges those things that you have to do just because it's what you got and you have to be uh um into it or you, you have to just come up with a good idea of how to make that part of the thing uh those things can sometimes really endure a project or a piece of art i think there's a lot of music that way too of just letting those subtle things that were mess ups and like trying to harness them as oh no we meant to put them there yeah yeah and of course as you watch in retrospect you know from a like a historian's perspective, it just makes it all the more 
interesting and endearing when you when you see that kind of stuff yeah well it's kind of the humanity left in things you know yeah. we don't we don't get to see the fingerprints as much because we can get rid of them Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I just, I feel like sometimes we want to make our stuff so crisp and perfect that sometimes the humanity, we take the humanity out of it by doing that. So, you know, you have to be careful about using these things and, and what energy they're bringing to your story. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think I'm kind of circling back the idea that, you know, to, to have, to make a good film burn asset or light leak asset, you're doing it with real devices, cameras and yeah. film and sensors and lenses and all that. Whereas, uh, you know, that's not the case with lens flares. It's like the differentiating thing between light leaks and film burn and lens flares. And I probably why lens flares look so cheesy so often because they're totally inorganic most of the time. Totally. Um, and I've not, and although I don't think there's too many out there. I've, I've, uh, like light leak, there's definitely a, uh, plugins for it. You know, just like all of these things, you can find a plug-in and put it over the top, but it just never, you have to use those in combination with other things for them to really look real. Uh, real. And I think that's along with those practical real effects. That, and you know what? It's fun to get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun to do and create those things. I mean, I remember spending a lot more time before I could make something digitally to make something physically that could, you know, be that, that uh, image or whatever you need to do. You'd spend a lot more time trying to make it and you'd have to make it tangible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, verdict on film burns. Should you use them? I mean, I think there's some situations where film burns part of the story. And so you got to do it, you know, like all of a sudden the fourth walls and you're like the narrator's now like, oh, the film's on fire. You know, you could do those yeah. kinds of things that I think uh, definitely are necessary. They're part of the story. Yeah. But, you know, as some way to, up your production value or something. I don't know. I don't think there, it, unless it's screaming, you need to do a, a, a film burn. I don't know what film burns really going to help you with, unless you're trying to just make something look grungy and that Even works. Then, it's like if maybe if you want to either trick your viewers, tricks a bad word to use here, but yeah. Um, convince your viewers yeah. that your video is actually shot on film. Uh, good luck with that. It, it's almost always pretty obvious at least yeah. to, to my eyes, um, then I guess you would use film burn in that case. But usually, like you said, it's, it has some sort of story element, right? Like, you know, you want to you want to make something uh, appear in the story as if it was shot on film. Like, you know, someone's watching some old home movies from you know the sixties. Yeah, exactly. You needed to look like you know eight millimeter film. Exactly. Well, so that movie eight millimeter surely used some film burn. Yeah. I imagine. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I remember. I think it's some kind of uh, killer movie. Or something. Yeah, that movie's messed up. Is it? I, I can't. Maybe that's why I've forgotten about it. But yeah, I think I think it's it's definitely you got to fit it in there. Uh, and I think that these are also things that I think all three of them should come as part of your pre production choices. The, I, I using these as band aids. It's fine. I mean, we all need band-aids from time to time, but the, it's it's much better to go, hey, I have a t plan to use this. And because of that, you're going to think of why you're using it. Mm -hmm. You're not just going to use it to help you overcome a problem. And I think then you end up finding those those places that are actually very warranted to use any of these effects. Uh, but if you are using them as afterthought, it's unlikely, one, it's going to be very convincing. And two, you, it might be dating your product. Yeah. Yep. Def, well, it definitely is the case if if the look happens to be a trend at the time and you jump in, you know, with both feet. Yeah. Um, like a lot of people did uh, after Star Trek, I guess, with the lens flares. Yeah. You know, so in the next video I make, I'm going to put all three of them in there mm -hmm. somehow. I don't know. Every shot. Every In every shot, there's going to be... <laughs> I'll have to put a, a countdown at the beginning, of course, and then I'll have to put, this is always the, the selling factor of that, putting a projector sound mm -hmm. or, you know, the sound, what oh, you yeah. think film, because I don't know what film actually sounds like. I've not, it's got to be like a ticking sound. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you think it's, it's going through a little track. Yeah. Anyway, that, uh, yeah, you got to put that in there to really sell it. Uh -huh. Maybe a little flicker in the, in the uh, intensity of the of the lumens in the shot or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I guess we, we should make at some point a video that tries to use every you know cheesy video cliche. Yeah, or or like 
here's how to use all of the effects in Premiere all at once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we used every filter on this one shot. It's, uh, there's a, it's a Rob Scallion video where he, he, uh, he puts on like 500 guitar pedals all at once. Mm -hmm. And like, I know people that have like five or six, and if you put all five or six on there, all you get is feedback. So mm -hmm. it's like, just imagine if that's 500. And uh, yeah, it's like, of course, it's going to sound like garbage, but mm -hmm. let's find out what it's going to do. You ever see that video on YouTube where it's like a VHS tape recorded over and over and over again? So a yeah, tape recorded the tape on a copy, and stuff. then the copy recorded, then the copy of the copy recorded. It gets down to like nothing. Well, that's, I mean, generation loss used to be something we actually considered when yeah, we were, right. you know, making copies of things. I, I don't know how many times I would have to redub a commercial because it had been played too many times. Like, that's kind of weird, but yeah. in these days, it's kind of hard to comprehend the, something that's uh, that was created digitally to have a uh, physical lifetime. Yeah, that's right. Not anymore. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I think that exhausts the topic, right? Yeah. It's time to talk about politics now. Yeah. No. We haven't Let's, done that in a while. But ended on politics, yeah. political note, but okay, we'll call it there. Yeah. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll get you next time. Big thanks to everyone for listening. As always, if you've been listening to the podcast and you enjoy it, we'd love it if you went to iTunes and gave us a written five-star review or Apple Podcasts, I guess it is now. I will call it iTunes until the day I die. That's just uh, that's, that's how I roll. Um, so for Chris Monluxi and everyone here at Videomaker, I've been Mike Wilhelm, and you've been listening to the Videomaker Podcast. We'll catch you next time.